very warm welcome um, to everyone from not such a warm evening down here in southwest France, and maybe it's better where you are. Uh, it's an enormous pleasure to uh, introduce Lars Mool to you. Uh, we met down here in this area and have shared uh, a number of uh, meetings um, actually in Montségur, and some of you will be familiar with Montségur, and I'm sure he's going to talk a little bit more about it. And just to say how I was introduced to Lars was through um, a mutual friend, um, Tess, who's on the call, I believe, tonight. Um, and she sent me a message saying I absolutely had to read um, this book here, <coughs> the O Manuscript, um, which is a few hundred pages, uh, 530 odd <coughs> pages, but in fact it's three books in one. Uh, the first is the Seer, then the Magdalene, and then the Grail, all, all very important topics. And, and so eventually, um, Lars and I uh, met up down here, and we shared a, a common interest in the feminine in, in Christianity, um, in the Essenes, um, in the Aramaic origins of Christianity, uh, in the mystical approach. And, and, uh, so, and, and I also happen to be, and many, most of you won't know this, I happen to be a quarter Danish, and my grandmother was Danish, and, and Lars um, is uh, obviously Danish and, and speaking from Denmark um, this evening. Um, you, you may also, if you've known and see, see anything about his biography, um, see that originally he was was a musician, and, and then he went through um, a, a very uh, a challenging transition, some of which he might describe to you tonight, um, and um, uh, you know, entered on a, a, what you might call an initiatic path um, with, with an extraordinary seer called, called Cali de Montségur. Anyway, tonight we're talking, he's going to be talking about his new book, um, The God Formula, which I've read and reviewed for the next issue of Paradigm Explorer. Um, and it's very nice, as I say, very good to see so many of you on the call this evening. Uh, and uh, so I'm now going to hand over to Lars. Lars, a very warm welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, it's uh, an honor to be here with you tonight and with all your participants. I'm asked to, to talk a little bit about my, my latest book, The God Formula. But, you know, as if some of you are, are speakers, inspirational speakers, and you do talks and so, uh, you know that whatever you are asked to talk about, you will always talk about this, the thing that really uh, are your topic, you know, and you cannot change that. It's, I mean, if you have been studying as I have and as David have since our youth, there is, you have to follow suit, so to speak, because one card, is on the table, makes ready for the next two and the next three and the next four, and hopefully it evolves in that way. And uh, it certainly did for me because my my path started when my little sister uh, died in 1960. I was nine, just becoming ten, and my sister was six. And of course, such a tragic event had some um, severe. Um, what do you call it? Um, it was really something that changed uh, my life in a very uh, forceful way. So I um, I started to um, to become very sensitive. That's the best way to to say it, really. And um, very early on, I started to. Um, my path, uh, the Jesus path, so to speak. I come from a, a, a working class background with no religion whatsoever, you know, like today, most Christians don't even, haven't ever read the New Testament. Most Christians today don't know anything about what their hero Jesus is all about. We go to church and we call ourselves Christians and yet we cannot see, it seems not to, be able to speak about it. Just think about you coming down to a cafe tomorrow morning and it's full of people and you and your friends start to speak about Jesus or the Holy Spirit. 
you will quickly find out that you have to lower your voice if you are not being taken to the asylum or something, you know, or people think, oh, you're crazy people from the sect or something. And isn't that weird that we are not able to or are not allowing ourselves to talk about an issue that is so important as our spiritual life? You know, the, the old wise man, Carl Gustav Jung, he actually said that all sicknesses stems from an, an irritated, uh, a religion uh, life that is not evolved. That we have a seed of uh, religious uh, feelings and, and um, yeah, something within us that needs to be unfolded in order for us to, to, um, to evolve in any uh, important way, in any way that matters anything. So that is why uh, very early on, I, I, because also I, when I went to the church, I, I, I thought there's something missing here. There's something that is not right. And I th think that's why uh, a lot of people ha is not really in tune with what is happening there. But yet still, we have to, I mean, I say to my friends, if you, if you don't believe in God, if you don't have any feeling towards this, why are you members of a church then? then go and, and get out of it and do something else. Go to football or whatever you, you think your religion is. Uh, but, you know, there is a saying actually in the New Testament of Yeshua, Jesus, that says a man or a country, a town that is not in alignment with its own purpose, highest purpose and calling, cannot stand, cannot be, must dissolve. And I think that is, you know, when you have been working with some of the, 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 the things that I'm going to share with you tonight, because the Essenes and Yeshua, they had deep insights in those things, you know, how that if you are not in alignment with who you are supposed to be, you know, remember when you came into this life, into this incarnation, you had a calling. And that calling was so loud until there was some sounds that started to become even louder than that calling. And in the end, you could not hear that calling because there were so many norms, so many well-meaning people around you who wanted to tell you what was right and what was wrong. And no, we don't do this here. You need to do this or you need to do that. So suddenly you could not hear anymore. Yeah, that's why, you know, the saying of Jesus, uh, Yeshua in the New Testament, that those who have ears hear and those who have eyes see, it's really, he's talking about that all the time. Please open your eyes and your ears and be attentive. Hmm? That's all it takes to, to start to walk the path. Just to be silent for just a few moments and open yourself up. Allow yourself to open up. I would like to share with you some of the things in the Bible that uh, that I found interesting, and you have probably heard about them before. And I, I mean, the good news about what I'm going to tell you is that we are all already enlightened beings. Hmm? You are already enlightened. I mean, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to read books. You don't have to uh, take any courses. If you only know that you already are enlightened. Because if you know that, you can start working, not out there, but in here. Because that is what it takes, you know, that you really start to direct your attention the right place, you know, towards the right place. You remember? Yeah, I also had to say the, the thing about the Aramaic language. In the, in the 80s, somewhere in the 80s, I was already into all the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nakamati scriptures, you know, the Gospels that didn't make it to the 
New Testament and all this. I found, and I found that so exciting, especially because they were sort of uh, secret or forbidden uh, gospels. And uh, of course, everything that is forbidden, you need to go and investigate, of course. So I did not really uh, go into the New Testament. I have read it, and but I've never really gone deep into it. So suddenly in the 80s, I stumbled on the Aramaic language. And it really hit totally clean into my heart. I, I mean, I was hit immediately. And ever since that day I found that language, it had been the, the tool that had opened my heart every day with new discoveries and new insights just by reading the New Testament from an Aramaic perspective. And also the Bible, you know, the Old Testament, because a lot of the Old Testament is actually original written in, in Aramaic. Also the New Testament was original written in Aramaic. But today we only have uh, the, the first uh, version of the, of the New Testament we have in Greek. But if you take the Greek and you translate it back to Aramaic, oh, do 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 do, abacadabra, it opens up like a magic box, and you, then all the secrets or all the insights appear once more. So that's the beauty of it. But um, do you remember in um, the Genesis, first book of Genesis, we were told that in the beginning, when everything, before everything was actually created, you know, God's presence was hovering over the waters. Hmm? Do you remember that? Just think about if you suddenly have a vision about something that you want to create, you want to write a book, you want to sing a song, you want to create something, a, a chair or a table. And first, before you, you manifest anything, the idea of a chair, of a table, a song, a book, are present, you know, in the vision. So just imagine that before anything was manifested physically in this universe, before the universe was even created, there was the idea of it, the waters. It was hovering over the water, the ethereal. And the, that God, the presence of God that was hovering over the water was the Sikina, the feminine part of God, of the Godhead. You know, nothing comes into this world only through the feminine principle. Everything comes through the manifesting power of the physical world, the feminine, the Shekinah. That is why actually the earth belongs to the feminine principle. That's why we call it Mother Earth. Just think of the Latin verb meta. Mata, mother, materia. Hmm? So you know it's all connected. We'll go, get back to that later. But the shaking air was hovering over the water and manifesting everything as he went by. And just like, phew, with a magic stick, manifesting everything. We can also read that God created man in his image. As man and woman, he created them. Yeah? What is that all about? What does God look like? What is that kind of, I mean, if we are born in his image, what does it really mean? Think about it. You see, there is a connection, a red thread from that saying, 
directly to Jesus in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, and in the Forbidden Gospel of Thomas, where he says, remember, the kingdom of heaven is within you and all around you. Yes? In order to understand the deeper level of what Jesus is really saying, because what I'm telling you now was the was the main uh, knowledge and insight of the Essenes and therefore also Jeshua. I mean, they were seers, they were healers, they were eminent astrologers, astrologers, astronomers. They were fantastic um, soothsayers. They were they were dream interpretators, and you know all these things. Scribes, wonderful scribes. But first and foremost. They hold the secret of creation. In order to understand what Jesuit means and how profound that knowledge is, you need to know the Aramaic concept of kingdom of heaven. And I present here my fantastic uh, PowerPoint show that I've made of myself. And I, I hope I can get... Uh, um, a patent on it because I find it very genius myself. You know, I got the idea many years ago. Unfortunately, I found out some other bastards have also found out the same. But anyway, you see here, Malkuta Desyamaya. Malkuta meaning kingdom, Desyamaya meaning heavenly. And just by the sound of it, just, just feel it. Try to say it for yourself. Malkuta de Shemaya. Malkuta de Shemaya. Kingdom of heaven. You see, the Aramaic is built from root words. A root word is a, a potential, a possibility awaiting its activation. And it's activated by our deeds and about our words. When I take a, a word like Malkuta de Shemaya and I put some energy behind it, you know, it is manifested. And now it starts to, to work, you know. But we need to, if I could find myself in this mess, uh, I would, oh, here it is. Just to show you what the root word in Malkuta, it is milk like this. You see, M L K milk. From that root word, there's other words in Aramaic that come from that, that is born from that. For example, angel, Malachi, messenger. Malachi and Malkuta is therefore uh, fami familiar to each other. In what way? I won't come into here because that's a whole nother a talk, but just for you to know how it works. But the most important root word is the root word in Shemaya, the Shem, as you see there. You know, to this day, the Jews are not daring to call the Lord by any name, so they call him Hashem, Ha being the definite article like the master or the name. Ha Shem means the name or the identity or the image of God within us. Hmm? Shem is actually that power that Yeshua is talking about, that that light, you know, light like consciousness or that sound or that vibration that must not be put under a bushel. This is really a, an important saying in the New Testament that he's really stressing. Please don't do that because then you, you, it's the same as you become a living dead. You know, you need to know what this power is all about. And guess what? The ayah in at the end means, which is forever. Desyamaya, heavenly, holds image of God that in which we were born 
And this principle we now are told lasts forever. It can never perish. So Malkutah, the Shemaya, is the kingdom of heaven within us that is forever. And it is so uh, connected to another thing you find in Exodus. You remember when Moses, he came, he went out to the desert and talked to God in the burning bush. He asked God, tell me what to do. And God said, you need to go and take the captives and bring them into the desert and away from the Egypt. Yeah, Moses said, but who should I say are calling us? Who are you? What is your name? So I can call you. And he says, my name is Eh, yeah, yeah, I am a share who or what is she I am. I am who I am. I am what I am. You know? And this is very, very profound knowledge. What does it mean? It is the presence of God within every one of us. It is just imagine that you are standing in a dark room, not knowing that right in front of you there is a switch. And if you just turned on that switch, that I am within you would just lighten up the whole room and everything else. Maybe you're also familiar with the, the I am sayings in um, the New Testament where Jesuit is saying, I am the bread of light. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the uh, truth, the, 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 the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the true vine. Everybody have heard, most people know about it. But is, does that mean that Jesus is, or Jeshua is saying that he is all those things as a person? Isn't that really the person who is saying, yeah, I am this and I am that? No, what he says is, I am is the bread of light. I am is the light of the world. I am is the door and so forth. I am is the way, the truth, and the life. Because the I am is not only in me, he tells us. Because why? You are all children of God, he says. Remember, he said, it's written that you are all gods. How do we... He's referring to that image of God in which we were born. He's referring to the I am, to the presence of God. And... We are going to talk about the presence of God because that is the most, as I told, the most profound knowledge and profound insight of these things in Jesuit. Because it's only true I am in this tradition that we are going to evolve and to, to really unfold all the potential that we were and all the gifts we were given when we came in to, into this incarnation. And the reason why, why we are here is actually to unfold these gifts and share them with as many people as possible. Remember, Jesus was saying, don't, for, I, I don't know said for Christ's sake, but don't hit it underneath a, a bushel. On the contrary, take it up on the highest mountain and let it shine out so everybody will be enlightened by it, also you yourself. But it has all to do with allowance, if we allow it to do this. And that is something, I think, I think exactly that is what is missing when we go into church, and we are not told this from day one. And we are not told either that what Jesus is saying, if you follow my example, you will do even greater wonders than I. Okay, what did he do then? He was going around and sharing his I am with other people in order for them to recognize the I am in themselves. Because through the I am and through the shim, through the kingdom of heaven within, we are going to be healed 
and we are going to heal other people if that's our why we are here and i think we are all here in some way to heal the world because the world have come to a sore spot we are actually standing uh, right there at the, the end of the cliff and at the threshold looking into the void and we really need to to make the right choice now and maybe you're a buddhist then go and find your goal there maybe you are a sufist or whatever but i find that i'm both a buddhist a sufist a, a jew or whatever because i don't find that there's any uh, real uh, difference between any of the beautiful religions it's only by definition and it's only by ceremony and by uh, you know words and it's exactly the same thing you know but we are born in the christian tradition most of us and when i met the dalai lama a few years ago he was talking about he did not understand when he came to the west that he met people from the west uh, that was uh, clothed in orange robes and shaved like Buddhists. And uh, not that it was wrong, but he just said, "Why did do do they do that when they have Christianity? When you have is the esoteric Christianity? I mean, it's all there." He said, "And of course it is." And I said to him, "That's why we need priests that know about the esoteric way because it somehow have died out. It's a dry." kind of there's no more living water in the in the you know in the well the well has dried out it seems yeah then you have to fill it again he said and that's exactly what i've tried for many many years not to go and tell anybody what to do or what not to do because those days are over all the google worship and all these things are totally over but i find that a teacher of today or somebody who wants to share somebody with other people cannot just talk about it. That's why we will do some, some practical things later on. And I also want to uh, share with you how uh, the whole thing about Mary the Magdalene and Yeshua uh, worked out with, with the scenes and all that. But first of all, this is so important that the, the main concept of uh, or insight of what it, creation was all about is ever so important that we start with that and that's why I start here. You see, the Essenes were also dealing with a, um, um, a, a, something that they call Rasnie, the mystery of becoming. The mystery of becoming Hasniye. Hasniye. And maybe you can see there is a familiarity between the Niye and the Ihe. Yeah? You can see that? So, what is that to become? The mystery of becoming is all about the I am. Maybe you also remember that uh, Moses at one time, when all the plagues were, were thrown at Egypt, and um, he's having a conversation, Moses is having a conversation with God, and God said, if you follow my law of light, you would be spared all the troubles, because I am your healer. I am your healer. So, I am is actually that part of God, our image of God we are carrying within us. That when activated, meaning when we discover it and really invite it into our everyday life, that will make the whole difference. Remember that I am the healer. I am your healer. And the art of becoming, the mystery of becoming is to become what we were supposed to be. Because it seems that when, from the very first day we came into this life, so many well-meaning people tried to, 
to escape us. And because in a very good meaning, they wanted the very best for us, our parents, uh, family members, uh, yeah, everyone that uh, had a say. And later on when we became, we had uh, idols of this or that, we liked that uh, group or that artist or, uh, you know, we were very, actually very conservative in many ways, black and white. We don't, we like this, but not this, you know. It was either the Beatles or the Stones. You could not have them both. Or it was Elvis Presley or it was Cliff Richard. Hmm? I mean, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. So, um, what we were, we should choose now, and we should learn right from the beginning was, remember who you really are. And we now want you to help you to activate the I am within you. And we would nourish it through all the, the years of upbringing, you know, when we were in our education and everything. And we would learn what it would take, how to, to activate the presence of God wherever we are. And it's not that we need to, to you know, people come to me, I cannot sit in the lotus position, so I cannot meditate. And that is, of course, a lot of good. But, you know, if we only knew that being enlightened already, it doesn't matter where we are. We don't need a church, you know. The church is here. The holy of the holies are the secret uh, chamber of the heart, the inner, the most holy of the holies. Do you remember when Jeshua was hanging on the cross and he gave up his life, the last breath, when he entered the bridge for the last time and went over to God? We can read in the New Testament that the veil in the temple was rent into like... <sighs> By lightning, it was like, shoot. Because until then, people were not allowed to see or come near the Holy of the Holies. Only one man could do that, the high priest. He went there once a year. He went in there on the day of atonement. He went in and prayed for the people and for Israel. But now, with that sacrifice, as it was, Suddenly, there was no veil anymore to the Holy of the Holy, meaning that our hearts now are complete open to this, if we allow it to be. That's the secret. We need to allow this in order. And we can do every time we have something. I mean, every time. Don't think about doing a good deed. I mean, never to think about, oh, I did this and I did that and it was a good deed. There's no such thing as a good deed. There's only you living up to who you really are. And if you live up to who you really are, you start sharing what you have with other people. Meaning also, if you pass by a beggar and you know 500 krona or the 100 pound or the 200 pound note or whatever you have in your, is meant for her or him, you don't hesitate. You go and give it. You see, my first, uh, I don't know, with that kind of uh, uh, charity was actually many years ago in the in the eighties, in the beginning of the eighties. I was still in the rock music business. I was in London in order to to sign a contract for a record deal. So I have my first day. It is it's so cold. I'm in Canton Lock. Under the bridge is an old lady, you know, with the uh, really shaking, standing with an empty tin that she's stretching out in front of her. And of course, I'm, I cannot pass by, you know, I have to do something. I've just changed all my, the money I had into pounds and I wasn't rich or anything. So I did not, I forgot all about that a hundred pound note in my, my world is really a lot, was a lot of money there at that time. But you know, hundred kroner is not that much. So I thought I would give her a hundred. And just the minute I just let it hover over her empty tin, and the minute I just let it go, I realized, wow, it is, it's a hundred, wow. And for a minute, I just stood there, you know, completely paralyzed about the whole situation. And just for 
you know, a split second, it just went through me. I need to change it. But of course I could. I mean, you cannot take it back and change it into, I mean, forget it. But the worst part was that this lady, she did not even smile or look at the money or say thanks or anything. She was completely numb, you know, and she couldn't care less. It seemed to me, and I, I was standing uh, for some time just watching her and I was thinking, hmm, strange. But one thing I got from it, my halo, you know, I went and for the, my last money, I bought some Brasso, you know, so I could, uh, you know, and the rest of the day, I was the big man of, I mean, one of the saints, you know, or one of the, the saints of God, you know, I really, it made my day in so many ways. But I learned a lesson. And when I met the seer, that was part of his program also. Sometimes he just said to me, without, I, have, I was not prepared. Do you have any cash on you? Uh, yeah, what, what do you need? Yeah, what do you have? Because I have uh, a 500. Okay, he said. Now uh, go down to down the, the main road and you find there's some beggars there. Find out who to give that money. But do it quick because we don't dream some more. What? Yeah. So I went and just gave the money, you know. And we should not think about these things. Every time we just do, we follow our natural urge, we are becoming, you know. Remember what Shakespeare said, to be or not to be is the question. To be or not to be. Shakespeare knew about these things. Asnie, the mystery of becoming. To be or not to be, that's the question. Suddenly, it rings totally new when you know where from it stems, you know. Shakespeare or whoever wrote those things knew. I know all the things that is going on about Bacon and I have no opinion about that, that it should be Bacon who, who did the Shakespeare's thing. It doesn't matter to me really. What matters is the work, not the person behind it. And I think that is also what Yeshua wants us to know, that when we really understand, I am the bread of life. No, 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 no. I am is the bread of life. So now it opens up to us also. Who are you? Who I am? Who am I? Who are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we doing here? These are questions we really, we, we ought to know about. We need to really find out what is. Uh... You know, also when Jeshua, he met the, the Samarian woman and they are talk, they're sitting by the well, the Samarian well, and Jeshua is, is telling her things. And suddenly she said, she says, are you the Messiah that we are waiting for? Are you he, him that we, I am, he says. Hmm? I am who I am. Again, the same principle, the image of God within us that we are all born in. Now we need to activate it. So every time, and you can actually do it in the supermarket. You do it wherever you, you go. And I'll share with you some of the, the some of the, the the mantras or the prayers you can actually do i'll also share with you because you remember because this is very important when we are talking about yeshua the essenes and mariam the magdalene malkuta deshimaya kingdom of heaven it's all there you see every letter of the Hebrew or Aramaic alphabet has a story. You know, there's books written of each letter, of the meaning of a letter. M is mine, or mem. M is mem in, in Aramaic, and from mem comes mine, water. Yeah. And you remember that John the Baptist is saying, 
I baptize you with water, but there will be somebody after me that will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Yes. So now you have the mime here and the feminine water element. Down here you have the shim or the s in Aramaic is the, the letter shin, which means fire. You know, or is representing the element of fire, the masculine. So there you have it, the feminine and the masculine. God created man in his image as man, man and woman, he created them. Yeah, just think about it. I'll go tardy, it's all in there. Hmm? The whole creation in one concept. A concept that we are told is forever and we are carrying it within us. So by just starting to think about it and accepting that it is so, is the first thing we need, the first step of course, in order for us to, to know that it will actually, in the end, we will have a chance to activate it and unfold it. And every th time we live up to who we really are, sharing what we give. There is another rule for the, that the Essenes were, were revering. That is, you cannot own anything before you give it away. When you have, it's only when you are given it away that you can call it yours. Let that stand just a moment. Another thing from the scenes, everything returns to its origin. Everything you send out returns to you someday, bad or good, whatever it is. One day you have to face everything you have done and said, everything you are given in the gift. Just think a simple rule like that if we were living by that. What a simple and, and, and wonderful world we could live in because nobody would then, you know, every time somebody is going down. We are all kind of going down. Every time somebody wins, we all win. There's no such thing as once dead is the other spread or whatever you say in English. It cannot be. It's an illusion. There's only sharing. That is the only thing. All it, the, all else just doesn't make any sense. So it is, I saw a wonderful film once. Uh, it was called The New World by a wonderful filmmaker that I cannot remember his name right now, but he's amazing. And in it, it's uh, at the time of just after Columbus, he came to South America and, and conquered everything. And all the missionaries are out there now. And suddenly there is uh, one from the, from the mission who are, who are lost in the wilderness and he's taken in by some of the Indians. And he, there's a, a love relationship between him and, and the, the daughter of one of the chiefs. And they cannot speak, you know, but she's all the time just doing like this. To watch him. Of course, he, no, no words are needed. And that is the wonderful thing about it. Just by intention. Why are you doing what you are doing? I'm doing this. And there's so much love in there. There's so much caring. There's so much showing that you are welcome. Come here. You know, my heart is open. Like an open door. So, you should remember the Essenes, they were a strictly male-oriented group, but that's the surprise about it, is that they also had women teachers, but only for certain uh, of the elect ones. Hmm? They had a heresy also. The oldest were, of course, the, you know, you had like, you started as a novice, you came in, you gave everything you had, and everything went into a common 
kind of uh, bowl and everything was paid for and you started there you had a two or three year novice uh, practice after that you went on and went on um, and in the end maybe you also became one of the elect ones it the scenes uh, society or, or sect was all started by Elijah, 700 years before Jesua. And you can read about Elijah in, the, in the, um, the, the Book of Kings, one of two. And he went to the Mount Carmel, where he established the school of prophets. And that was really the first, so to speak, um, the foundation of the, of the, um, the scene community and from that it spread to Damascus to Jerusalem to different places in in the desert and especially by the Dead Sea Qumran by the Dead Sea and uh, at the Qumran at the Dead Sea they established a university and that's what you can go and see the ruins today it's still there but a lot of the, the scholars and, and scientists that they really cannot find out how 5,000 men were living there because it's, it's not that big, you know. So they thought that they were living in caves all around. Of course not. You can actually read in the Old Testament they were living down by the coast of the, of the Dead Sea and they had their main um, uh, village, so to speak, where today the kibbutz of Engedi lies. And Engedi was a kind of uh, oasis where, and if you've never been there, this, it's one of the places you, you need to go one day because it's beyond words actually. But anyway, so the Essenes, as I, they had one main purpose, to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And the Messiah means the anointed one exactly as the Greek Christos means the anointed one. A lot of people, I mean here in Denmark, some people actually think that uh, Jesus is the first name and, and Christus or Christensen is the, the surname, you know, like, oh yeah, Jesus Christensen. But of course, we know that it's not so. Christ means the, the anointed one. So like John was the Baptist, Jesus was the Nazarene. Jesus, the Nazarene, meant not that he came from Nazareth, because we know today that there was not, no such thing as Nazareth at the time of Jesus. From the, the um, Jewish um, historian from that time, uh, oh, his name slips my mind now, Flavius, mm, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, he had described the Essenes very precisely, and it, pres and it described the whole of Galilee very, very precise, even to the, you know, smallest uh, bump on the road, so, and no mention of, of Nazareth. But na the na Nazarenes had a kind of uh, a, a camp there, and it was very close to the School of Prophets. So you can imagine that Joseph and Mary, also being Essenes, were living as Nazarenes because they were Nazarenes. And you can read in the New uh, Old Testament what Nazarenes were all about. You could not cut your hair; it had to be uh, in the middle. Uh, what do you call it? Oh, you know what I mean. And you had to be a vegetarian. And they had a lot of other strict rules that you should, they should live up to. So they were preparing the way for this teacher of righteousness, as they called him. You know, they had every now and then, like an avatar that came in when, when it was needed, they incarnated a teacher of righteousness, exactly as a kind of Dalai Lama in the Tibet tradition, you know. And you know how it is. There is some science, and there was some science that you can read in uh, lots of the Old Testament about the coming of that Messiah. He, he had to come from Bethlehem, and he had to this, and he had to that. And there was a lot of signs they could go by. And there was a certain constellation of stars called the Melchizedek constellation. And when the time came, the three oldest from the three oldest elect ones 
from Kumban, who, which are just east of Bethlehem. So they came three wise men from the east, but only it's only a you know a few hours right from from there. Went and they read all the signs and they found the child, and we can read they take then took the child into to the temple immediately because there was there were two Essenes there Simon and Hannah who were both told that they would not die before they have seen the Messiah so in order to get the uh, the last blessing for this they took the child and it was of course recognized by both of them Simon actually said now I have seen him I can go I can die in peace and from there they took him to Egypt to Egypt in order to do all the preparations work right from he was not very uh, old. And when the time came, they went back to uh, to, to uh, the settlement in, in the school of prophets and, and the settlement of the, the Nazarenes. And when he was uh, being confirmated, being uh, having his bar mitzvah, he was taken to Jerusalem and he could be there as 12 years old. He was having a conversation with all the rabbis there. And there was a, a rabbi from the Pharisees called Hillel who, who saw him also as the Messiah and wanted to present him to the other rabbis and get their kind of blessing for him. Also. But they, they completely was taken by him. They, they were full of pride. They could not handle that this child was so much wiser than them. So from there, he was taken to uh, the Kumaran University, where he had his, uh, his first real teacher, Judah, Judith, uh, which was a woman, a uh, very, very skilled woman from the, from the tradition of Zarathustra. But she was in the scene too. And she was the one who took him to the East and to Egypt and then back. And when he came back, he, the last initiation was actually by John the Baptist in, in the River Jordan where he was baptized. And after that, the very last thing he did before he went on his mission was to go 40 days in the desert to meet his own shadows for the last time, to meet Satan, his own ego, and just get done with it. So he, he was ready to purify himself. And that cave where that happened is just the cave for a man-made cave that is just beneath the, the settlement of uh, the university at Koman. You can see it in one of my videos called The Gate of Light, where I'm performing one of the, the ceremonies there. But where, what did Mary the Madeline, how does he fit into all this? You see, at the time of Tishua, there was also a, an old Jewish um, prophecy about that when the Messiah comes, he must be united with the silver cup of um, the tribe of Benjamin. The silver cup of the tribe of Benjamin. What is the silver cup? You see, right from Moses' times, when Moses was leading his people through the desert, he had a sister called Miriam, who was a healer, a seer, and a singer, a dancer. But not, you know, a, a dancer in that way. But she, she was rock, uh, dancing in front of the whole congregation. And with her, she, she opened up the, the stones and the cliffs and water sprang from them. Yeah? And of course, there's a lot of metaphors in there, water being live water that Yeshua is later also talking about. And to this day, in the Jewish tradition, you have this, that if you go up on Mount Carmel, on the mountain of Eliah, you can see down at the well of Miriam, the sister of Moses. So you have Eliah, the prophet, who later became John the Baptist. And you have Miriam, who later became Mary the Magdalene, who is an early incarnation of her. 
But where Jesus in all this? He was the pupil of Elisha, of, of Elia. His name was Elisha. And when Elia was about to leave this world, he brought Elisha to the same place at Jordan where he many years later baptized Jesus as John the Baptist. Now Elisha, Jesus, is asking Elijah, please master, give me the double of your wisdom. And Elijah said, if you can see me as I go in my chariot of fire, it's a given to you. And that's exactly what it is. It is given to you. You can see here on this lovely icon, um, that here you have Elijah in his background, and you see, um, where is it? There is the the um, uh, the mantle that he is giving to, which is the the all the office of of the prophet that is being given to Elisha. You see. So and there you have here. You have the baptism many years later at the exact same spot where. So it is like now Jeshua is going to, sorry, to pay his due to, um, to jo Johan, to John. He's actually going there to pay his due and say, Yes, I am now accepted and I will now be the one who is carrying it on. And from that moment on, he's ready for it. But there's one thing that we have missed. How is Mary the Magdalene coming in here as the cup of, of Benjamin, the silver cup of Benjamin? You see, Jesus is of the tribe of David and of um, Joseph. And there is something in, in the whole political and religious situation at that time that in order to restore the Jewish nation and retake the temple and get the, the, the Romans out, two families has to be united. So already when Yeshua is 16 years old and Mary the Magdalene is 12 or 13 years old, there is a kind of fixed, not marriage at that time, but a fixed engagement where they hardly doesn't see anybody. They see each other. Hmm? So they are just committed to each other now because by uniting those two tribes, then it, the whole Jewish nation will be restored from, um, from the Romans. That is the thought about it. So Jeshua is going back to where he come from and the thing I've just told you, the, his whole uh, education. And Mary the Magdalene, she's going to Alexandria where she's being taken in by the therapist, which was a mystery school where both women and men could come in. And we can read about it. Philo, from a Jewish philosopher from that time, have written extensively about the therapist and also about these scenes. And from there, we can pick up a lot of information about how they... Um, you should imagine that Mary the Magdalene, she, she will come there as a very young girl. And she's living now with her, her teacher, an elder woman. They're living in a hut. They have each their room. And every week, all the week, they work extensively into what that girl, trying to find out what is the purpose of this girl. Of course, they knew that she was had this role to play, so she was having the whole thing, you know, the whole package, being a healer, a stargazer, um, knowing about herbs, knowing about prophecy, uh, yeah, all these things. She she became what you would say a doctor in its highest aspect, you know, of the word, you know, not just a doctor in this or that, but for the whole human being, physical, psycho, uh, psychological, and spiritual. And after that, she has, he has, she has her final uh, initiation as a moon priestess. And after the break, I will 
I will tell you more about what that's all about because I've actually met one and I think you will get some inspiration when I tell you this story. But anyway, so when she's finished with her education and it's all coordinated, so when Jesus is, or Jeshua is finished with him, they meet up where? In Cana. And you remember the story about the wedding in Cana. That is actually the wedding of Yeshua and Mary the Magdalene. And from that moment on, they really went on the mission that were to last three years. And she was the, became the disciple that became the teacher of the women disciples. And he was, of course, the teacher of the male disciples. They were traveling side by side in equality. And that is something that is, you should remember that when Jesus had died on the cross and he was just uh, hovering between the worlds, so to speak, before he chose to show himself in his light body. See, as we can read in, in both the New Testament, but especially in the, the Gospel of Mary, when she had seen uh, Jeshua standing up from the graves, he went back to Jerusalem and said, I, friends, I have seen my beloved in a vision raising from the dead. And from, you know, we can read in New Testament from that moment, Peter is actually about to strangle her because he cannot, he had never understood anything about what Yeshua and her were all about. And he was right, actually jealous amongst them because he saw for himself that he was the one who was sitting at the right hand of the master and ruling everything, building a church. That was why Jesus, he foresaw it all and said, you are the stone of that church. Get behind me, Satan. Hmm? Because Peter was always, he was really a, a huge believer. But he was a simple man and he did not know about the I am and what it really meant and what it took to, in order to. That was much more like Philip and Thomas, Thomas and John. Those people, they knew exactly what it was all about. So you should imagine that when. It's only because I think it's Philip who interferes and said, if the master could listen to this woman, why can we not? But there's no doubt from that moment on, we hear nothing more about her. And from that moment on, all the groups, almost all the groups, are actually doing a character murder on her. For 325 years, that's what's going on. She becomes a simple prostitute. Why? Because the word for moon priestess uh, in America has many layers and it can mean in some way uh, prostitute but not in the way that we um, we think about a prostitute but as years came by that's what she became you know but she was a moon priestess knowing a whole lot of things that she was giving to Jesus remember in the I'll just read this before we have a break um, that in the Gospel of the Nazarenes, Jeshua is actually saying this, and just listen carefully. I and my bride are one, just as Miriam the Magdalene, whom I have chosen and sanctified as an example for myself, is one with me. I and my bride are one, just as Miriam the Magdalene, whom I have chosen and sanctified as an example to myself, is one with me. Jeshua is talking on one side of a bride and on the other side about Mary and the Magdalene. And he's both one with the bride and the Mary and Magdalene. What is he talking about? You see, bride in Aramaic, kalta, has many meanings. It could actually also mean what we today would, would uh, understand as anima, you know, the feminine principle within man. And what Yeshua is saying here, I and my anima, I have discovered my feminine principle within me. And that principle, I now have recognized, see it mirrored in this woman, Mary the Magdalene. And therefore, 
I've chosen her as an example, as a teacher in many ways for me, because we are one. It's not just beautiful. I mean, it's, it's unfathomable. I mean, wow. So we have to understand that it must have been the same way for Mary the Magdalene, that Yeshua represented the, the masculine uh, principle within her. So in that way, they were mirroring each other. More about that later. Mary the Magdalene, what does it mean? Does it mean that she came from Magdal? No. There was many small cities at that time called Magdal, meaning a high place. But Maryam the Magdalene, Maryam the Mag Maryam Magdal means Maryam the exalted one, the one who is above things and can see things, you know. And funny enough, when you read the gospel of of Mary, her own gospel. That is exactly what she's saying, that we in the future, this is the, the thing that it will be open for us if we want to, when our eyes become one single eye and it's no, there's no more darkness. And when we turn on the switch for the I am within us and understand what the kingdom of heaven, what is all about, and we start to let it shine out there and just to share it with everybody. Because nothing, we cannot lose anything. There's nothing to lose. The only thing we can lose is ourselves when, when we turn our backs to all our, the gifts we were given. Instead of being um, so much uh, taken by all the new stuff that we can buy, and I mean, it's all so fascinating that there's no end to it, you know. And when you are bought one thing, you want another thing. And so you, we know all this. Of course we do. So the real gift is for free. It has always been there and will always be there. And just think about it. Next time you go out in, in life on the street tomorrow, don't ever think about, I'm now doing a good deed. I'm doing charity by going there. Forget it. Just do it. Don't think. Go and do it. That was exactly, because then the presence of God is, it's like turning on the switch, you know. And the light is there. You cannot fathom anything. You don't have to, to understand anything. Just turn on the switch. The minute you begin to think really about it, that's when the noise starts, you know. There's one thing we have to understand that we here in this world, we are living in the world of questions. And if we want real answers, we need to go to the world of answers. And Yeshua and the Essenes knew about that. More about that after the break. Now I'll give the word to David and Andrew. Uh, they know much more about what's going to happen now. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lars, for that spiritual nourishment.